so yeah, as, as Raza was saying, you know, I've been working at the Intercept now for the past four years. Um, I actually have a degree in film uh, and communications uh, from Park School. Um, and before working at the Intercept, I actually worked in film distribution um, for, you know, I did distribution of foreign language films in the US. But, you know, I've always sort of, um, um, I've always been interested in communications and in journalism. So when this opportunity came up, I applied and, you know, <clears throat> and I got the job. And um, I think that, I don't know if you, are, are all of you familiar with The Intercept? Who, I guess maybe I can see all of you uh, has, who has, ne has never heard of The Intercept there? If you can raise your hand or I can see everybody from there. No, they all have, they all have because <laughs> they were- an applicant thing here, I can see everyone. From some of them are forced to click the links <laughs> so through the yeah. syllabus, you know. <laughs> Sounds great. So let me just share my uh, slide here. Is it working? Yeah. Excellent. So I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the Intercept. You know, we are basically an investigative journalism organization that's really mission driven and dedicated to holding the powerful accountable through adversarial journalism. So the Intercept is not really in the business of sort of publishing news in the sense of breaking news or news about we don't cover, you know, daily events in the same way that New York Times or other, you know, Washington Post do. Um, we really are in the business of sort of publishing investigations and analysis on, you know, politics, war, surveillance, corruption, the environment, technology, criminal justice, and more. Um, as you might have noticed, we don't do film reviews, for instance. I mean, we'll do one every now and then when we think that a film or a documentary has, you know, a connection to a topic that we are invested in, you know, when it's a documentary about surveillance, for instance, the, a, a, an issue that we've been covering, you know, since the start of the organization. But really, we're not in the business of sort of culture, you know, uh, just covering, you know, a series or, you know, a cultural product because for the sake of it, you know, we really kind of have this mission of kind of disrupting uh, power structures that, you know, have a, um, you know, a hold on to our society, onto the democratic process, et cetera. Um, you know, and I think that we're really driven by this idea of the public interest. You know, we really want to kind of serve the public and create journalism that has meaningful impact in the United States and abroad. Um, I think that's also another interesting uh, factor of the Intercept is that we're not simply serving, you know, a U.S. audience. We also have this sort of, you know, a global audience in mind. Um, and you know, besides um, the English edition, we also have. An office in Brazil, and so we also publish stories in Portuguese and sometimes in Spanish. Um, I just want to maybe talk about a couple of recent investigations that we've done because I think that they are really representative of the kind of work that we do and why we do them. As we know, we work a lot with leaked materials. I mean, we, the founders of the Intercept, they were really, they were the journalists who were working with Edward Snowden. So that was always been, you know, that always has been. An, Part of the DNA of the organization. Um, and hackers and sort of like people who want to leak materials, they often think of the intercept and come to us. So that's sort of a good thing about kind of having a reputation in that space is that you sort of end up like, you know, people tend to trust us and tend to sort of leak that material to us. And recently, you know, an anonymous hacker uh, provided the intercept with hundreds of thousands of records from two healthcare companies showing that they had worked with this pro-Trump uh, group called America's Frontline Doctors, founded by Dr. Simone Gold. And they were basically, um, it was a sort of a, a chain of organizations that were basically referring um, uh, people, uh, were sort of like spreading propaganda about COVID and then referring the same people that they were convincing that the vaccine didn't work to other organizations so that these other orgs could sell them uh, discredit COVID-19 uh, treatments, you know. So that was a great example of a story that we had, you know, access to all this information. It was really critical for us, obviously, to not expose anyone's, you know, personal medical data. Um, at the same time, it was clear that, you know, these organizations were working together in order to profit from this information. So that's a good example of a, you know, a story that had a tremendous impact. Uh, and I think later I'll talk about impact, but this specifically led to an investigation um, at the house of, you know, by, uh, in the 
House of Congress. Um, we also published, you know, several exposés into uh, uh, Senator John Manchin's ownership stake in coal companies, um, exploring how these ties may have influenced the swing senator's policy stances. I think we were really interested, you know, in Manchin because, you know, obviously he sort of had for a while he was sort of the key figure in whether President Biden would be able to pass uh, some of his, uh, you know, reforms. Um, we also reported on a leaked Zoom recording of Manchin and billionaire donors discussing legislative strategy. Um, and we then we exposed this uh, another audio recording of the same dark money, dark money group dangling campaign contributions in front of other conservative Democrats who do their bidding. So sort of like, you know, connecting the dots here between, you know, why a certain senator takes a certain policy position, you know, um, and what kinds of connections they have with interest groups like, you know, billionaire donors, et cetera. Um, we've also been doing really great work on the pandemic. And as, I, as I'm sure you've known, like anything related to the pandemic and the origins of the pandemic has been incredibly politicized. Um, you know, I think at the, you know, a year ago, it was sort of impossible even to entertain this idea that maybe there was a lab leak, you know, that, you know, that was seen as a sort of a, immediately a conservative, you know, a kind of like propaganda um, uh, argument. And this certainly was in the way that Trump was spreading uh, awfully racialized, you know, theories about why, uh, you know, the Institute of Virology in China had, might have done something wrong. I mean, he had no information and was just spreading fake news. But I think from, from for us, we realized that it was always something that we needed to investigate and sort of like, you know, dig into. Um, we have a really great team of First Amendment lawyers. And so using them, we filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. And we ended up obtaining, we had to, it was very complicated. We actually had to file a FOIA, we got denied, we had to sue the state. But we ended up getting 900 pages of documents revealing how the NIH uh, uh, funded um, research uh, being done by EcoHealth Alliance. And that that research actually engaged in gain of function, was actually gain of function research, you know, which is sort of this research that makes viruses more pathogenic in order to study them. Um, the story, you know, really reached millions of readers and really sort of broke down this idea that, you know, that if you are a Democrat, you can't ask questions of the government, you know, of Fauci, or that, you know, you have to sort of racialize or sort of immediately make assumptions about, you know, just because you're asking questions about the origins of the pandemic and what kinds of research were being done in Wuhan, it doesn't mean that the pandemic started there. But I think it's a you know, the job of journalists to really inquire and ask questions. You know, I think our coverage also um, has been, you know, we've been, we're still on that beat and we've done actually several, several stories on that topic. And we also sort of discover, uh, did a major story about a leaked grant proposal to DARPA, which is the research army of the United States military, um, detailing high risk coronavirus research. This was basically, EcoHealth Alliance submitted a proposal to DARPA to do, uh, to basically change the coronavirus, to basically do a, create a coronavirus that is very much like the coronavirus that caused the pandemic that is out there now. And DARPA, which is the military, you know, which is part of the military, said that the research was too dangerous and they denied funding. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the kind of research that was being done there. Um, Another really good example of sort of articles that we're doing, like Sharon Lerner, um, is a fantastic environmental reporter, works with us. She's been working with whistleblowers at the EPA, uh, who are basically um, have decided to come forward and really risk their careers and risk their lives, basically their livelihoods, um, to, to talk about the way in which managers at the agents were routinely removing information from reports about risks of dangerous chemicals, you know, and, re and to sort of reveal what they thought was a pattern of extensive and improper influence of the chemical industry over the regulatory agency. Um, these stories are amazing. I really encourage all of you to go and check the, this series uh, at The Intercept. Um, it's really, it really shows the process in which, you know, a scientist that's sort of, for instance, examining a substance that's being 
added to you know a pesticide or a chemical that's going to go to market they actually say you know we really need to study this there's evidence that this can cause cancer and then his manager just go and like <laughs> immediately erases that from the from the report because they want uh to please the the the, the chemical industry the companies that are being that are pushing for the approval of these substances um we've also done this was just by the way like in the last six eight months like these are all investigations that we've done in the last year um we've done a series of investigations on oracle um about how that's you know it's a oracle is a major software company um, how they've been selling uh, soft surveillance software to Chinese authorities. Um, we're also the first to report that the US bought cameras from China in violation of our own sanctions, uh, resulting, in a, resulting in an internal house oversight committee investigation. Um, national security, you know, we've been doing great reporting, I think, uh, on the sort of US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, it's a, of course, it was a major story last year, but we continue to sort of invest and sort of really think through the consequences of the withdrawal. Um, <clears throat> like a, a big story that we had was that the Taliban had seized U.S. military biometrics devices uh, that um, had basically information and database about Afghanistan and about people who worked with the U.S. government. Um, we also did a major expose on to how the CIA was directing the Afghan army, uh, a special unit actually of the Afghan army that is basically a death squad unit to kill children and to do incredible, like horrible atrocities. Um, we actually had proof, was it, we were able to get proof that the CIA was not only authorizing those operations, but were cooperating and helping them um, to to get that done and, and to, to conduct these operations that were literally killing dozens and dozens of children. Um, and that particularly that story won several like uh, awards, including uh, a nomination for a National Magazine Award, um, which is sort of the Oscars of journalism. I'm just gonna go over quickly the sort of podcasts and multimedia projects that we do. Um, you know, one, I think our latest in, uh, is a podcast called American ISIS, uh, which is, uh, basically the story of Amer an American man called R Russell Dennison, uh, who was an ex-convict and, and Muslim convert who joined the Islamic State in Syria. It's basically the only story, I think that we were really, um, <clears throat> I'm sure you guys remember the New York Times um, uh, podcast that turned out to be false. You know, like this is actually the, the real, um, a real story of an American that actually went to fight and died and died fighting in Syria. Um, we had a, another podcast that was a Pulitzer finalist called Somebody. Um, and by the way, these are all nonfiction podcasts, you know, that we are produced in house. Um, uh, this one follows a, a mother, Shepherd Wells, um, to basically sort of on a journey to find the truth about who murdered her son and what was the uh, Chicago police's role in basically letting him die. Uh, uh, he he was found in front of a police station um, uh, and the police basically didn't do anything. And this mother just sort of like dropped her entire life and spent two years investigating his uh, murder. Um, we just uh, launched the second season of a criminal justice podcast called Murderville. Uh, the first season was called Murderville, Georgia. Uh, and the second one that just you can check on our website is called Murderville, Texas. Um, that's sort of another amazing story because the first season of Murderville, uh, it was a story of a wrong, wrongful conviction case. <clears throat> and it basically got a man out of death row. Like it, it, it was a tremendous story that, you know, we sort of uncovered evidence that had never been discovered or uncovered. And because of the work that our reporters did and over the course of a year, uh, this man had spent 20 plus years uh, waiting to be, you know, on death row was released earlier, um, late last year. So, you know, and we also have our sort of like two regular podcasts are called Intercepted and Deconstructed that I highly recommend as well. Um, I wanna maybe talk a little bit about the business model. Um, and if you have any questions, by the way, feel free to stop and, and ask. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about sort of how we fund ourselves. I think everyone knows that the sort of we received seed money from you know Pierre Midier, who is a, a billionaire uh, and has several like philanthropic projects, the intercepting first of media is just one of them. But his project was never to just fund us, you know, into infinity. He really tried to sort of create um, a structure for us to um, basically fund our own work. And the way that that he envisioned that was to basically create a company that would have a nonprofit side and a for-profit side. And the intercept is in the nonprofit side, which is basically a sort of recognition that the kind of journalism that we do, you know, cannot have profit as its main, um, um, <clears throat> you know, goal as its aim. Um, so the idea was really to sort of fund a company, have a, a media company that would have a for-profit side. The company would make enough money to fund its own operations and to also fund the journalism of the intercept, but. In addition to that, we also have a membership program, which is basically we ask for uh, readers to donate money to us. And we also are exploring, you know, sort of major philanthropic support and are going after grants and things like that. But we don't have ads on our website. We don't charge people. There's no paywall on the intercept. Um, and our journalists, you know, often spend months, if not, you know, sometimes years working on stories. So there's no pressure to sort of you know, publish like clickbaits or to, you have to publish, you know, three stories a week, you know, no matter what it is, just put something out. Like that's not really how we work. Um, so our journalists are really given the freedom to kind of pursue stories and to spend a lot of time working on them and doing, you know, the reporting that it needs. But just to give you a, a sort of an idea of the size of a membership department, um, you know, it was basically, a, it's a donation program that was launched in 2017, and it's already the largest membership program in US nonprofit and digital media. Um, we had, um, I think, over 70,000 donate uh, donor, donors um, in 2020. Um, and I, as I'm sure all of you know, like uh, once Trump left office and Biden came in, there was this sort of major slump and major traffic, you know. Uh, Lots of newspapers, basically every newspaper in the country lost like an average between 20 and 35 percent of their traffic. Um, so I think we were impacted by that as well. But last year, we still ended almost uh, at the same level, that, you know, raising almost as much money as we did in 2020, which is a major achievement, I think. Um, and again, this is by just sending emails to people, telling them what we do and asking them to donate what we can. Um, because um, you know, what we do is driven by a mission and by a sort of uh, a drive to really kind of um, <clears throat> change the world and to you know, sort of um, have you know, a concrete impact in the world. We really, we really Im the impact of our work is something that we really take seriously and that we really work to measure. And this is one of the many things that I actually do at the company, you know. <clears throat> I think that we, we, we always, of course, like want to maximize the impact of the impact, not the impact, the reach of our journalism. In other words, like we always want as many people as possible to read our work. And that's why our work is free and available to the public. We know that often this question of impact is relative and that you can have a great impact just by sort of reaching the right people with your journalism, right? Like if you want to, do a story that really impacts a certain community, you have to make sure that that community reads the, the, you know, the articles, or sometimes you just need the right people to see your story to really kind of create the change that you, that you want. Um, so for every investigation that we do, we always sort of establish um, both sort of broad and specific target audiences, because we know that one, we want everyone to read everything we do, but also we know that every story has an audience and that we want, and we, and that audience is the audience that really is going to matter in terms of achieving the impact that we want. Um, <clears throat> so I want to just kind of give some of the things that we take into account um, when we measure impact. You know, one is policy policy change. You know, at the federal level, like the Sharon Learner CPA series uh, led to the announcement of the uh, led to the creation of two internal scientific advisory panels. 
um, at the EPA. Um, and um, it's literally, literally leading to an entire revision and sort of like uh, rethinking of how the EPA uh, approves chemicals and, uh, and how um, managers can edit uh, the work of other scientists within your organization. Um, this story about the, <clears throat> the network of right wing healthcare providers, um, as I said, led to a, a house investigation into America's frontline doctors. Um, and I'll work on Joe Manchin really sort of, you know, inspired and, and what got picked up by all major organizations like the New York Times, Washington Post. So this is an example of how we you know, broke news, we really kind of went after scoops and discovered things that no one had uh, brought up, brought up things, we wrote about things that no one had brought up before, and other organizations really sort of followed us and ended up kind of helping us, uh, you know, achieve the impact that we wanted uh, for that coverage. Um, I think that's it. I sort of went, rushed through because I wanted to give you all time to ask me questions, but, you know, I think that the Intercept is a really um, unique organization. And I think that it's sort of a privilege these days to work for an org that doesn't um, really prioritize profit over you know, the public good or over a sense of sort of values and, and, and you know, public service.